And so we have three great panelists who are all at very different vibrant agencies really moving in this space in different ways. So we're going to hear about their roles and some case studies of the work that we're do they're doing. I just wanted to take you through a little bit of a concept that I'm looking at right now as an external consultant in this space. And there's an initiative I'm working on called StoryTech. And I think this fits right into this topic. And StoryTech is all about taking storytellers and helping them collaborate with technology companies and brands and bringing them together. Because what we'll find, and you'll, you'll see this and hear this as a theme from today's very attractive and intelligent panelists. Um, I don't know why I'm kissing their ass. They're not going to hire me or anything, but anyway. <laughs> Please continue. continue. All right. Our very distinguished panelists, um, what we're, what there's, the theme here is that we all speak different languages, that tech folks and creative folks and brand and content folks all speak different languages. And so what I started to see was this need for someone to do some translation. And again, you're going to hear from these gentlemen that they're all in many ways acting as that translator in their various roles. And what we've really started to see is this ecosystem forming where content or content can be a, a, an ad, content can also be something from Hollywood, content can be anything that you're ingesting basically. We really see that content sits at the center, technology companies, brands, distributors, all sorts of different tech platforms now are all in this swirl around content. And the traditional roles of who does what is really blending. And so it's changing again the way that we all move through this. And the interesting thing about this is that everyone also in this ecosystem has different goals. So if you look at you know, what an ad agency wants or what a storyteller wants or what a tech person wants or a brand wants, they all have different business reasons for working with each other. And that's why it's so imperative now for agencies, brands, tech companies, everybody to collaborate and come up with new working models of how we're going to move through this space. And the challenging thing is there's no one answer. We just know that the consumer now is using devices and content and, and, and engaging with brands in a whole new way. And, and so we have to jump on board if we want to play. Um, and I just wanted to show you a few examples of how this is playing out just, you know, all over the, um, lots of different case studies here. So are you all familiar with Zbox? So Zbox is a second screen app that you download and um, NBCU, Comcast made a big investment in it this year and it's an app that you would um, watch a show with and it would be synced to that experience and you would receive additional content. I definitely think you should download it and play with it. It brings a lot of um, social media and a lot of information like Wikipedia and all that kind of thing about a program and it really creates an, a, you know, a great second screen experience for consuming any content on broadcast television. And what you're looking up there, uh, up there is a screen grab from something that they did for March Madness where they literally took the March Madness grid and they made it interactive on your iPad or iPhone or whatever device it was that you were use using while you were watching the game. So they combine the technology of online and the broadcast and, and the creative spirit around March Madness and this idea of, of uh, you know, betting and predicting teams and created an app for it. So that's just one example of these worlds coming together. Another example is something that's being pitched right now for the New York City Library. And what this is, is are you all familiar with NFC? Near Field Communication, which is something that those of you that have Android devices, it's probably available on your Android device. It's very similar to RFID tags. It's the ability to trigger a reaction from a mobile device through another experience. It's going to happen in retail a lot and it'll allow you to trigger some type of content experience on your mobile device. So what happens here, and the concept here is, let's get people re-engaged with the library as a brand, because right now we don't really think about the library in the same way that we did you know, when our grandparents and our parents were growing up, because we all are downloading books and experiencing books in a whole different way. So in order to get traffic back to the library, they came up with this idea, which is in the subway, you would literally have what looks like a bookshelf. And with your mobile device, you would go up to the bookshelf, and through NFC, you would literally be able to download a portion of a book. And so then for the rest of your subway ride, when you are underneath the ground, you'd be able to engage with that book. 
So that's a great example. Isn't that a cool idea? Near field communication, NFC, which mostly right now in the press um, and in the industry is being talked about for commerce, for mobile commerce, but it's also a great content delivery experience. But here is a great creative use of NFC to re-engage you with the brand of the New York City Library. Um, and another example here is just some project projection mapping on the floor um, of a, a basketball um, a coliseum and a basketball stadium, um, and that is now an ad buy. So this is actually for Coors during March Madness, and you can kind of see the mountains, which is their logo. So using a technology, projection mapping, to create a very creative experience for an ad buy on the floor of a basketball court. So pretty cool stuff, right? And all these ideas, again, are coming from the minds of people who are thinking about the tech and how it can be creatively enabled. And lastly, I just wanted to end my setup with this, is just talking about what just happened when the new pope came aboard. This is the first time where um, the pope, as soon as he was made pope, sent out a tweet and that the entire experience happened digitally across the world. And for the first time in the audience, people were holding up their cameras to take pictures. And there's this great shot um, that I, could, I couldn't find, but I'd seen it, of the differences between the last pope being elected and this one, and that no one, maybe two people in the audience had a phone they were holding up to take a picture. And th this year, everyone had phones holding up to take a picture. And CNN had their busiest social experience ever on their site with people consuming content from this global event. So you start to see how these worlds are merging and they can't be separated. So to take us through how real agencies are doing it and getting it, and we have three great agencies here that are really moving through this in, in such a powerful way and taking us through their case studies. So the first one I want to bring up is Husani from um, Wyden and Kennedy in New York, a well-known agency. So Husani is going to take us through his role and what he's doing at his agency, how they're thinking about this space, and some case studies. You can hold your thunderous applause for later. <laughs> Hello. Um, before I start, I'm just kind of curious. This is like satisfying my personal curiosity. How many agency people are, are in the audience? All right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I'm always curious about the sorts of folks that, that come to this sort of thing and kind of care about the topic since it's, since it's something that, that at least is near, to, near and dear to my heart and I think uh, I'd hope to other agency folks who are trying to kind of figure this, this world out. So. Uh, uh, before I really go into stuff, I kind of wanted to set the stage of exactly what we mean or what, what I mean by technology, not necessarily ad networks or banners or that sort of thing. When, I, when, I, when I'm referring to technology or technologists, I, I mean, I'm really talking about front-end devs, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, back-end devs, um, iOS and Android devs, and, and, and quality assurance. And that, that's the makeup of the technology team at, at Wyden, New York. Um, We've spent, we as in this industry, I think we've spent the past few years really trying to figure out how do we, well, first, do we need to uh, integrate the creative side and the tech side? And, and then assuming the answer is yes, how do we do that? And what's the best way to do that? And how, how can we do that without taking away from the st storytelling that creatives do and, and taking away from the technology building that, that, that developers do? Um, and it, it appears like there are, are a couple of paths that, Agencies seem to be going down, right? Uh, and hire an in-house team, find some devs, stick them in a room, give them some ideas, they make things. Um, generally, they, they come in at the end of the process. So, you know, you've already sold through a concept to a client. You've already designed it. Maybe you tech vetted it, maybe you didn't. Then you send some PSDs over to the devs and say, okay, so you got two months, go, go build it. Um, <laughs> That's probably not the best way to do it. <laughs> um, uh, and the, the other way is sort of similar to that, right? It's, it's just it's shopping it out. It's, it's outsourcing. It's, it's finding a vendor uh, in the country or outside of the country, and you're, you're shipping off ideas. The, but the, these ideas have been baked. They're already finalized and ready to go, and all you're using technology for, all you're using these dev teams for is to make things. Um, and uh, respectfully, I think you're doing it wrong. Ooh, wow, tough crowd. It's going to be one of those. Cool. How many people voted for this match? Just kidding. <laughs> we are in San Francisco, so I don't know. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think you're doing it wrong. I, I think 
uh, the concept of having technology at, at, at the very end of the process is kind of strange. I mean, I'm a technologist, so of course it would be strange to me, but, I, but from, a, from like a logical standpoint, it, it, it makes very little sense. If you were, say you were designing and building a house, I think during the design phase, you might want to talk to a contractor, or you'll end up with kind of a shitty house. I don't, I don't know. That's, that's, that, that's how I see it anyway. Um, take a quick break and talk about some phrases or words I'll be using through this um, because we all seem to have different definitions of those words. Um, when, I, when I use the phrase integration, I, I, I mean the opposite of what I was just talking about, right? Not having technology at the very end of the process, but having, ha having uh, technology as members of the creative team. Um, the ideal situation, and it's, it's something that, that we've been working pretty hard at Widen to, to, to sort out and, and make reality, is, is having diverse skill sets on one team. Not having these sort of separate silos and separate groups who talk to each other in status meetings, but, but there's no real integration happening. So again, when I use the word integration, I mean actual, for real, like holding hands integration, one team. Um, the phrase creative technologist has also been talked about a lot over the past couple of years, and we all seem to have different definitions of, of, of what it means, although I, I'd like to think it's pretty straightforward. Um, just the word order, you're a technologist who's creative. It's not the other way around. There, are, there seem to be uh, folks who think that uh, a creative tech is a, is a, you know, a creative or a person who comes up with concepts who sort of kind of understands what the internet is. You can come up with the ideas, but, but you can't build them. Um, as a technologist, I find that, again, kind of weird and kind of bizarre. If you're a technologist, you write code. You know how to write code. Um, but there's a difference, I think, between being a developer and being a creative developer, or, again, a technologist and a creative technologist. Um, developers are awesome. Developers make things. Do developers add to the stories that we're trying to tell as marketers? Do they, do, do they have a solid impact on user experience and, and, and how that user experience works with the story, again, that we're trying to tell consumers? Uh, I, I, I tend to, to disagree. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we've structured things at Wide in New York. So we consider technology to be a creative craft. Uh, our developers, our creative developers, our creative technologists are, are storytellers just like an art director tells a story or a copywriter tells a story. We are, we, we are intentionally not seeing the build as separate from the idea. Um, and and to, to sort of to push that internally and to make sure our clients understand and to make sure other, other groups outside of us understand, we're actually changing the name of, of the internal team in New York from technology to creative technology. And that's going to get, I know when I say this to people, I, I, I get tomatoes thrown at me. But it's really because, no matter how controversial the phrase is, I think it's important to understand that we see developers and technology as uh, people who contribute to the actual creative idea, not just the people who execute things in like the nerd basement. Now, I grew up in the nerd basement, so I'm not judging the nerd basement. The nerd basement is awesome, trust me, but, 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 but that stories and, and compelling thoughts don't necessarily come out of, of that from an advertising and marketing perspective. Is anyway. leadership at Wyden and Kennedy behind this? Have they asked you to make this change, or did you ask them? Or the how to Leadership is behind it 100%, yeah. I mean, we're talking from, from, from day and widen through our global ECDs, through our office leadership. This, this is a move that, that has been given a thumbs up. And it will That's be important. communicated to clients as well. Right, okay. right, right. And you know, our current clients out of New York, are they've, they've seen my face way too much over the past couple of years I've been there. Um, so they're, they're very used to, to, to technology people being around. I think they, they will appreciate how we're sort of tweaking the language a little bit to make sure that, that, that we're involved in, a, in the creative process as well. Um, so... While we're changing the, the, the name of the group, we're not changing how we operate. This is how we've operated since, since when I started to widen two years ago. This, this is how we work out of New York. Um, tech is involved on day one. We're in pitches, we're in tissue sessions, we're in initial client conversations, we're in briefs to the creative team. Um, because again, we're not putting tech at the very end of the process, we're integrating it again, that word integration, for real, true integration from, from day one at every part of the process. Um, and it's important to, to keep in mind that while concepts are being developed, 
technology is working with the creative teams, not for the creative teams. Which goes back to what I said, we're, 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 we're not the nerds in the basement, we're not the vendor. We really are like, literally sitting around the same table spitballing ideas and we're acting so much more than just you know, vetting for feasibility or vetting for, for budgets or schedules or that sort of thing. Um, I think if the, if the medium is the message, yeah, yeah, I know, but whatever, just bear with me, uh, who, who else would you want helping to craft that message than the teams who make the medium? It just, it just strikes me as such an, such an obvious need, and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of surprised that, that over the past couple of years this has been not just like, okay, and now we're integrated, let's go. But, you know, let's be realistic about, about what this sort of integration means from a sort of agency process and, and logistics standpoint. Um, it's important to, for, for technology teams to understand that creative teams do things differently than us nerds are used to. Um, and the, uh, I, I have a lot of friends at a lot of agencies doing, doing very similar things and we're, we're trying to instruct our tech teams that this, this, is, a, this is a real collaboration and this is a, both sides have to compromise a little bit of their process in order to, to come together as one team and, and, and make strong work. Um, so uh, I want to take you through uh, a quick case study. Um, I, it's an example of a project that, that was heavy creative and heavy tech, and it would not have worked as well as it did if, uh, if the teams were not, were not integrated. So this is a, a, called Quick Controls Chaos for, for Jordan. It launched uh, early 2012, and I was happy to see that the other day, uh, you know, the, the Webbies were announced, and the site is an honoree. Not a nominee, but that's okay. I'll take it. Um, so, so site for Jordan, um, heavy flash and video site, and it was designed to illustrate, uh, it, it was for the, uh, the launch of the uh, new uh, uh, Chris Paul uh, Jordan sneaker. Um, and it, it was supposed to illustrate how, how CP's quickness causes chaos both on and off the court. My agency friends know that that sounds like such an agency phrase, but it really, that, 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 that was the, 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 the goal that we tried to hit with the creative. Um, uh, and users could could go through this 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 video. It's maybe 25 seconds in real time, but it it, it could speed up and slow down like Matrix bullet time style. Uh, and and you could swing around a 180 degree arc and watch a, this basketball play happen both in real time or sped up or slowed down. And as you spun around the arc, you could see that sort of 3D movement as 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 the camera rolled around. Um, none of us had ever built or thought about anything like this before. Um, and this is the sort of idea that, you know, I've, I've outside of Wyden, I've, I've been at places where the creatives would have come up with that idea and had a five minute conversation with the one developer who might sit near them. And it says, oh yeah, that's possible, sure, fine. And then only when you get in development do you realize, oh, this is actually really damn complicated. And there are all sorts of things that, man, if we, if we thought about this when, like, before we made the video, maybe we could, have, we could have solved the problem and it wouldn't have been a problem. Um, so in this site, uh, there were 49 different camera angles and you see, you know, we've got, we've got Chris Paul in the center and those sort of orange slots all around were meant to be actual cameras with the in-between slots being virtual tweened cameras. And again, the idea is as a user, you can go from the camera on the extreme left and swing through the arc and pause and play and pause and play as you swing through the arc to get to the, to, to the other side. Um, as you can imagine, there were technical challenges in, in this concept, right? So one, capturing this video on, when, uh, during a shoot. How do we capture footage that's synced perfectly from 17 different cameras? Um, once, we, once we do that, I, I think there, each, each camera captured enough footage to be a two hour feature film. So that's a whole lot of video. Um, because we're not like making CD-ROMs for people anymore, we needed to figure out a really smooth and elegant way for, for this stuff to load. Uh, obviously these videos were streaming, but still there, there is, there's load time necessary. Um, and as you're moving around the camera arc, we needed to make sure that each time you, 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 know, you, you swing through the arc and you hit one of those real cameras, we're switching a video stream. So, how does that happen without lag time? How can we come up with sort of interesting technical and creative solves so that the, the experience felt fluid and engaging and, 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 and interesting? Um, I, I, again, I, I, I can't emphasize enough that if, a, if we outsourced it, if, if the tech team had not been involved, 
from day one and working with the creatives to refine the concept, identify these challenges and come up with creative and technical solutions for those challenges, I'm not sure we really would have been able to pull it off. So we did a, a three day shoot at Paramount and again, this is for a website. There was no TV involved here. This is the power of, of, a, of a, an agency known for traditional work getting into really interesting tech stuff. We've got amazing TV people. We shoot TV every day. We know the ins and outs of the process and the ability to bring the, the, you know, the teams who know the ins and outs of the technology, it, it, it ends up uh, working really nicely. Um, you know, we had, it was a huge shoot, 200 extras, huge production team, huge agency team. Um, but all of those people were, were involved and working together, which is kind of the, 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 the point I'm trying to make here. Um, you know, my Flash programmers literally sat behind the director as we shot Chris Paul and these 200 extras, and we collaborated on what was good and what wasn't. Uh, here's a real quick video that shows how the site actually functions, so all of that blabber I just did, you can kind of see what it, what it meant. or maybe I will just screw this up because as a technology director, I cannot use a laptop. Chris Paul is one of the quickest point guards in basketball. When he has the ball in his hands, he creates chaos for the opposing team. To promote his newest shoe, the Jordan brand wanted to demonstrate how Chris's quickness created chaos on and off the court. It created an interactive website that gave users something they had never experienced before, a chance to experience live action film from every angle. In order to achieve this, we built a first-of-its-kind camera arc, featuring 17 red Epic cameras, capturing a single play 180 degrees around. In the end, more than two feature-length films worth of content was captured to support every angle. To bring the experience to life online, we had to develop a video streaming architecture to support over 100 videos being swapped out on the fly. Users can swing around the camera arc, change speeds, zoom, and scrub forward and backward. There are bonus scenes to explore and bonus content hidden throughout the entire experience. We tapped into traditional game mechanics to encourage replay, keeping track of how much bonus content was unlocked and giving hints for items that users did not yet find. In the end, we gave users something they had never seen before, video game-like control over live action film. So really, the things to remember, tech is a creative craft and should be integrated with other creative crafts. Um, the more diverse people you have on a team, the, the better the work is and, and the more fun it is for the team and involve technology from day one. So that's that. Thanks so much. Husani, while you're, um, while Theo, Theo is going to come up now, Theo from Traction, um, and while he's sitting up, and I think you're two slides forward from there, um, just one, one question for you. So um, in terms now of how um, you guys move through a new business pitch, do they come to you and ask for a resource so that even when you're in front of a client at the very beginning of a project, are, are you, is there someone from tech there? Yeah, there is. There, there is. Uh, we, we've changed the process now so that there is a technology person, either myself or one of my tech leads, in every conversation. It's part of how we do it now. Thank you so much. All right, so Theo, take us through what you guys are doing at Traction. Okay. How's everyone doing? Woohoo! All right. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, Husani asked earlier how many of you are from agencies? How many of you are from the creative or technology department at agencies? Uh, smattering a few. Well, thank you for showing up. I know you probably all have work to be doing or something. <laughs> I know I do. Um, so, I'm from Traction. Um, I am too tall for this microphone. Um, I am one of the founders and the executive creative director of Traction. We're an agency that started in 2001. Um, pretty much out of necessity, we've, uh, the four partners at that time had come from various agencies throughout the Bay Area. Um, and if anyone was here during 2001, uh, knows that a lot of agencies uh, downsized and folded uh, due to the dot-com bomb. Um, agency I was at, uh, two of the partners were at, um, was a uh, tribal DDB, the uh, interactive wing of DDB Needham, um, and uh, they closed their San Francisco office. So I lost my job. So my partners and I decided, oh, fuck it, let's start our own agency. Um, 
in the strike that from the video. Yeah, <laughs> in an economic downturn, really smart guys. So <laughs> we started our own, our own agency and uh, really built it, integrated from the ground up. I, I know Husani talked a lot about um, creative technologists and and that and and. And most of the, the, the partners were uh, three creatives and a technology person. We didn't have any account people. We didn't have anyone from business. Um, we were an integrated agency, and we learned all the other roles as we grew up. Um, so basically, uh, we started a company at the worst possible time ever and have built it from four founders to about 35 people in the last 10 years and have uh, worked with some very large companies, uh, not as big as Wayne Kennedy, they do really cool stuff. But, um, <clears throat> but basically we built our business on the philosophy of uh, uh, psychology and technology. Um, so what do we, we mean by that? Um, basically everyone, every user, every consumer has a certain point of view that they are, are looking for when they're, when they're thinking about digesting media or more importantly advertising and marketing. And how can we leverage technology in a creative way to service that psychology of our consumer? Um, much like uh, Wyatt and Kennedy, uh, we have cross-functional teams. Um, we break it a little bit wider. It's not just talking about integration between the creative and the technology teams. It's integration across the entire agency. So every project we do has basically five core team members. And that would be strategy, UX, creative, technology, and then uh, the poor producers just get called PM. Um, that's just how, what we think of them. But they are part of the team. So uh, as I said, every project has this uh, relationship. So whether it's a banner campaign, whether it's um, a video project, whether it's a website, um, we bring this, these core disciplines to the table at day one and have them represent work uh, th for their different disciplines and their different expertise on the client project. It's sometimes perceived as expensive. Um, but it's how you get really great work for your, what your clients need. Uh, I think much like uh, uh, Martin Kennedy, having your technologist show up day one and tell people what they can do, what's appropriate for the project, what's going to work with the creative team and be collaborative applies for everything else, including project management and, and producers. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if the tech team says, we can totally build that. It doesn't matter if the creatives think, this is a great idea. Because if project management's not there to go, no, we don't have the money. <laughs> then it's all for naught. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Oh, so one of our clients for the last, well, I guess six years, has been um, Adobe. And we specialize primarily um, on doing social uh, integration programs for them, uh, for a variety of their groups, from student to the CS group to even a, uh, various other product families that they have at Adobe. So uh, one of the things when we talk about being an integrated agency, um, you know, social's still sort of, well, it's not quite the redheaded stepchild it was four years ago, but it certainly has been disruptive in the agency space because it doesn't really always fit um, the model that we're all used to, whether it be TV, print, or even interactive media, because it's a walled garden to a certain extent. We don't have quite the flexibility that we used to. Um, really, for my, my team and my company, we just treat it like as another medium. It's not, not really that excessively difficult. Um, it has its own limitations. But so we do a lot of programs within, within the social media world, including Facebook, which if anyone here develops for Facebook knows what a challenge that can be because they keep changing the, the rules arbitrarily, <laughs> regularly, and then half of your stuff doesn't work, which is really hard when your client has paid you a lot of money to make it work, and you, on you come in on Monday and it doesn't anymore, no fault of your own. So, <clears throat> uh, like I said, we work a lot with Adobe, and for this particular uh, case sample I'm gonna share with you guys, uh, Adobe came to us and said, um, we wanna talk to students, and we wanna talk to students who aren't our core audience, their core audience obviously being designers when it comes to the creative suite. Um, we want to talk to students in business and a variety of other places and get them excited about the creative suite and using it. And we said, okay, that, that sounds great. And they said, we want to put Photoshop in Facebook. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Um, and we want people to build a t-shirt. Cool. Uh, as an agency, we like problems to solve, and that was a pretty ugly problem to solve. If any of you here have 
with played in Photoshop, it's not an easy program for a novice to digest. Um, if any of you have experienced anything with design, know, know that you know, just the concept of a novice designing isn't an easy concept to digest. And they wanted us all to work in a platform that quite frankly is very rigid and structured and doesn't always allow you to do all the cool flexible things you want to do. Oh, and they wanted it to be mobile. which again, if you work f with, it, with Facebook at all, knows that's also got its constraints. So what we did was come up with some really groovy ideas and make it work. And basically in the end, <coughs> truncated the key features of Photoshop into an application that actually worked in Facebook. Also worked outside of Facebook and also worked in mobile, um, which as you know, you can only do with HTML5, so we had to throw Flash out the window, which Adobe, of course, really wanted to use because it's one of their core technologies and part of the creative suite. Um, but the reality is, it just it just wouldn't work w across the platforms we need. And again, if my technology team wasn't there, the first thing we go is, oh, let's build this in Flash. It'll be very easy. It's got a lot of <laughs> things that we can leverage to build that Photoshop-like functionality. It wouldn't have worked. It would have, would have failed. So <coughs> building more on the HTML5 framework allowed us to do a lot more as far as the flexibility of the platforms we need to develop for, but also for the functionality for, for the uh, target audience in general. So I have a little bit of a video um, just to sort of showcase the features of, of the experience itself. It doesn't talk, so we don't have to worry about that. I'll talk over it. Oh, thank you. Um, but it does have music. So basically, you know, a user would come in, they'd go through their Facebook uh, and end up in a tab where they would be allowed to pull from a, a library of assets and pretty much do what you can do in Photoshop, which is scale, recolor, you can add type, you can add shapes, you can do visual effects to it. Um, one of the key things that hadn't really been done before that we had found, we actually built one of the key components of layering, with which if anyone works in Photoshop knows that's a, sort of a big thing. So people could add as many layers as they wanted. Um, to build out their design. And then actually drag and drop and ship the layers, uh, opacities, as well as their, uh, their uh, space in the visual plane so you could do your layering. Um, we had to build a whole set of custom fonts um, and a variety of other things in the end to basically rebuild something that was already perfect, that didn't exist in the space and that everyone already used, but for whatever reason, uh, the client wanted someone to be able to do it in Facebook, uh, which we thought was a great challenge and very much in the end was very successful and people could go and build their t-shirts and either enter them in contests or have them actually produced uh, through, through the experience. And that's all I got. Well, let me ask you something. So no how, questions. Yeah, questions. How did you build? No. How, how, how do you guys decide what new tech platforms to take on? Because you know, WordPress, Yammer, those were the hot babes last year. I, you know, I remember I got, went down a dot nuke, you know, bad, bad dot place. <laughs> so, I mean, how do you pick what to train your folks on and what to build projects in, you know? Um, that's, that's a really good question. I think if anyone has spent any time out on the showroom floor realizes that what's happening currently in our market space from both a technology and a platform perspective, um, it would be a polite, a polite way of describing it as a cacophony of crap. Um, it's really hard to figure out what's, I know I'm really nice, aren't I? Um, it's hard to figure out what's gonna be around next year. Uh, and honestly, when Facebook first launched as a platform, um, we weren't early adopters. Um, we certainly played with it for probably a year or so, but the fact of the matter is, with any technology that comes out, um, we pretty much play with it internally um, and then treat every project as a problem to solve. Technology is not a means to an end, right? You need a problem that technology will help solve. So we base what we choose on what problems we need to solve. Um, and then as we solve more problems, obviously certain technologies come to the surface as, as tried and true. And quite frankly, we look out in the space and see what other people are doing, what problems they're solving, what technologies they're using, and make educated decisions based on that. Um, I see a lot of agencies get narrowly focused on a certain technology, like WordPress. WordPress has been sort of the hot button for smaller agencies. Um, you know, I came to my, my technology director and said, well, we should invest in WordPress. And he said, no. 
And I was like, well, well why not? He's like, because it's crap. I'm like, okay, oh, okay, is it really yeah. crap? He's like, it's really crap. Okay, so we'll move on from it. So let, let's, bring, <laughs> uh, let's bring Todd up to sit up and then take a question from the audience. Hi. Ooh, the, the jacket's coming off. This jacket's is serious. <laughs> it's a little warm up here. Uh, <laughs> my name's Todd. I've worked at Huge for about six and a half years. I started in the Brooklyn office and moved to Los Angeles about two and a half years ago. Um, I'm working out of the Los Angeles office. Um, we have about 80 people in the Los Angeles office right now. We're, we're growing pretty quickly. When I first got there, we were about 25. Um, so at HUGE, we really aspire to design what's next. Um, our best clients are really businesses that are looking to go and reinvent themselves or to do something truly game-changing and impactful um, in digital. Unfortunately, the reality, though, is that some of our clients sometimes struggle to produce truly innovative or game-changing products, so our job is often uh, to bring creative thinking to their business. So at HUGE, we really believe that what's good for uh, users is good for business. The answers to creating successful businesses um, is to design amazing experiences that people fall in love with and return to again and again. At HUGE, we also see ourselves as the user's best advocate. Uh, we try to ensure that every design decision considers the users. On every project, we ask these three things. What's the point? What's the inspiration behind the project? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? Second, is this uh, something that users will engage with and use? Um, is there a real need for this? And third, generally, uh, the best experiences have a focus. Uh, and try to do one thing really well. Um, so we always ask ourselves, is it, is it simple enough? Additionally, I, I believe that we're, what we're really trying to do is really to change the world. I mean, we try to create amazing experiences that are a mix of utility and delight um, that actually change people's lives. They change the way people interact with media. It's a small goal. It's a, <laughs> it's a small goal. But I think it's also an overarching goal. And thematically, I think, um, the way that we sort of position technology and creatives um, and even client services is we're all in the service of, of this, this goal. Um, we're all user experience designers. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about process and approach to collaboration. And first let me say that the work that we do is really complicated and really hard. Um, when I talk about process, it sometimes can be misconstrued that Somewhere out there, there's like some kind of a perfect process or a silver bullet that's going to solve for everyone's problems, and um, I, I don't believe that that exists. Uh, the creative process has very chaotic elements, um, and I think that part of um, doing what we do means harnessing that chaos um, as a force for good uh, to help improve our work, not to make um, our work easier or simpler. Another point about process is that every uh, project is, is different and every client is different. We don't have a single approach to solving our clients' design problems. Um, and each project plan is really nuanced to accommodate the uniqueness of our projects. Uh, on every project, we ask, our, ask ourselves the, the, the same question. How can we encourage teams to push ideas and to push their creativity? So, we typically embrace uh, what are often considered opposing sort of forces or approaches to design. Participatory design is kind of like, um, if you think of someone like Jacob Nielsen, it really relies on uh, qualitative and quantitative inputs to make decisions throughout the design process. On the other side of the spectrum, you've got genius design. So think of someone like Steve Jobs. Uh, this means that you're really relying heavily on instinct and intuition uh, to make decisions. Again, different projects require different kind of mixes of these sciences and arts to find the right balance to solve that kind of a problem. Generally, uh, Waterfall is great for projects where there are very few unknowns, and Agile is great for projects when there are a lot of unknowns. And Todd, is that, I never heard this before when you talked about it with me. Is this a traditional approach to describing this phenomena, Waterfall and Agile? Traditional at huge? Well, I guess huge or anywhere. Would anyone else? I don't. Have? I don't believe so. I mean, typically, um, 
this is sort of a, a continuum where most agencies or, or, or client side companies will fall on either one side of these spectrums. Usually people are like, oh, we're an agile shop or, um, you know, or we're strictly waterfall. Um, but at, at huge, I mean, our general approach is um, we sometimes mix approaches throughout uh, even waterfall and agile in a single project. Um, we'll take one track and throw it into more of a waterfall process if it feels that's more appropriate. We'll take another track, tear that off, and do something that's really strictly agile. Um, so, and and I, this is kind of a cop-out because most people, um, you know, usually say, hey, we're waterfall or agile, and we really, really genuinely do kind of mix this up and choose our, our, the weapon of choice um, of what's appropriate for each different project. So I'm going to talk briefly about our approach to the work we did for HBO Go as an example of How many of you have played with it, by the way? It's like the greatest yeah. second screen experience in the world. All right, you all have to download it. If you don't have a subscription to HBO Go, I can't help you. But, <laughs> but uh, there are discussions that you'll be able to subscribe separately from having a uh, broadcast subscription. But anyway, sorry. It's right. just it's one of the best things out there, really. Yeah, we definitely love it. Um, the initial concepting team was one very small interdisciplinary team, um, very focused. They sat together, they ate lunch together, they drank together. Um, the approach for HBO was really to work as quickly as possible and to review ideas and designs as quickly as possible. So we had internal design reviews every morning um, and every afternoon. We also reviewed with the, reviewed with the client um, a few times a week, two to three times a week. Uh, we had bigger reviews with uh, more senior stakeholders with the client to look at more sort of um, polished prototypes. But um, much of the work that we reviewed with the client was also in varying degrees of fidelity. So we looked at everything from gestural uh, sketches to wireframes to visual design treatments to quick time uh, to actual functioning prototypes that actually had a, a, a code base and, and was live. Um, we also had multiple tracks running at, at different times uh, where at varying degrees of fidelity. So something might be being prototyped as a functional prototype. Something else might have uh, been broken off into uh, kind of more of a wireframe approach. Um, and it's important to note that this does not work for every client. I think this worked for us because of the trust and the relationship that we had with the HBO client. Um, we built a rapport with them. Uh, that they were able to look at gestural sketches um, and that seemed to work really well. I would not say that this is something that we would use for every single one of our projects. So specifically for HBO Go, um, our initial approach was to really exhaust very quickly as many um, uh, directions as possible, as early as possible. So the questions that we were really trying to answer was um, what's the best way to present HBO's content? Um, in the beginning, we really explored hundreds of different uh, variations or directions. Um, we slowly began to narrow them down. Uh, I think we looked at 28 different versions of the home page. Um, and in the end, our collaborative approach resulted in the very first uh, iPad uh, designs that were launched in April 2011. The iPad, um, just some stats, had a million downloads within the first week and three million uh, downloads within the first month of its release. And then we began rolling this out to different uh, devices. The approach to rolling it out to different devices was different from our approach to the, to the initial concepting, um, which I think is kind of the, the general theme. Uh, and in short, successful collaboration at HUGE is, is these three things. Um, a plan that's flexible and that can bend to accommodate the creative process and ensure that innovation is never inconvenient a culture that also emphasizes what's doing right for the user um, and focuses on next generation solutions. Um, accepting the user experience is uh, that the user experience is changing all the time. Behavior is, is a moving target. Um, with the way people behave today in relation to, to ex digital experiences is different from how they're going to behave tomorrow and how they interact with it tomorrow. Um, people, we're always looking for great, uh, passionate, creative, smart people. Um, can't stress that enough. And uh, just to end on my, my final note, we're, we're hiring. So um, if anybody is interested, we have an office in, in, obviously in Los Angeles. We also have an office in San Francisco. Um, so please talk to me if you're interested.
So do, if you have questions, let's have you guys line up at the mic. And I'm just going to start off by asking the, everyone here, and we'll pass the mic around. 